you know, I began this journey like 10 years ago now. I'm, by training, I'm a systems engineer. I was working on the Ethernet way back in the uh, 90s, when the Internet was a small thing that nobody ever heard about. You know. And um, one of the things we had to do with there was to make the system as robust as we could, so that the Internet doesn't fail. And there are things that we had to do, you know, to look at all possible ways the interference comes in and make sure that your system that you're designing is robust in the face of all that. So, when I started working on the environment, and this happened because I happened to see Al Gore's presentation on TV, and I was so shocked by what he was saying, I said, if half of what he's saying is true, what am I doing working on making things ten times faster? So I decided to study the problem, and within a few months I realized it's far worse than what Mr. Gore shows in his presentations. Because he only talks about the energy problem, and there is a whole other basis on which the energy problem rests. So I like to use the analogy of, you know, someone with a persistent mild fever and a lump the size of a coconut by the side of uh, his head going to the doctor and saying, can you please heal me? And the doctor examines the patient and he says, well, that lump is causing your fever and the best I can do is to prescribe Tylenol for your fever and make sure that your fever doesn't go over two degrees Celsius. I mean, as a patient, would you then say, can you please make sure it doesn't go over one and a half degrees Celsius? Or would you say, what about this lump? So when you ask him about the lump, suppose the doctor says, I'll make sure it go grows. I'll make sure it doubles in size as quickly as possible. Would you say that there's something wrong with the treatment? <clears throat> right? But that's exactly how our world leaders have been treating the earth. I was so shocked when I found out that this is, I think a lot of people know that this is what's going on, but they don't see any way out. They just stuck <coughs> in this mode. See, in 1992, when um, the Rio summit happened, the UN formed a committee to look at what are the major problems in the environment and how do we solve it. And so they identified three major problems. The first was biodiversity loss, the second was ecosystems collapse, and the third was climate change. Okay. And then they formed a committee to look at what would be the solution for this. And this was called Agenda 21. I don't know how many people have heard of Agenda 21. So, Agenda 21 was um, worked out by a committee at the UN, and they came up with a plan for how to deal with these problems. And it was completely a top-down plan. So that involved essentially a world government. You went taking over from all national governments and prescribing how everybody lives and making sure that uh, our footprints are reduced everywhere. You know, it's a top-down solution. And it obviously didn't go anywhere. So President Bush, the first Bush, went to the UN at that point and he said the American way of life is non-negotiable. And Agenda 21 completely failed. Right? So they formed three commissions. Um, three, they call it conventions. Three conventions. The first was the Convention on Biological Diversity. The second was the Convention to Combat Desertification, which is about ecosystems collapse. And the third was the Framework Convention on Climate Change. So the first two conventions, they met every year. All of them met every year, initially. 
And the first two conventions came up with goals. They said by 2010, we are going to make sure that there is, there is no more biodiversity loss on Earth. So that was, every nation agreed to it. They all signed it. And 2010 came and went. And biodiversity loss was continuing to decrease, you know, continuing to go away. So then they decided to make the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention to Combat Desertification meet once every two years. So they cut down their funding and just focused on the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which still happens every year. So I've been attending this uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. I attended it the last two years in Paris and in uh, Morocco. And before that, I attended the one in Durban. And I got thoroughly disillusioned in Durban itself. Because it was clear that they were not addressing the whole problem. They were only looking at the symptoms. They were just looking at the fever and not the cancer. And this is why you don't hear about these first two conventions much. Because that's addressing the cancer. So one of the first things I realized um, by 2008, is that if you wanted to do something about the cancer, the number one thing you can do to address all of these problems simultaneously is to go vegan. Okay? If you wanted to just address the fever, you would replace the energy infrastructure with solar. But nobody talks about going. So I was part of Al Gore's um, climate project at that point, and I wrote to Mr. Gore, and I said, so here are the reasons why I think you, we need to start talking about this. We need to talk, start talking to people about changing their lifestyles, and especially with our food habits. Because food turns out to be the number one source of energy use. It's, uh, if you look at the solar energy that's falling on Earth, and Half of that, I mean 45% of that land area of the planet is being used just to grow food for us. So, in essence, you know, imagine how much energy is falling on 45% of the land area of the planet. That is all going towards producing our food. So if we change the food, our food habits, then you reduce your energy requirement quite a bit, by the way. So I wrote to Mr. Gore, I had 70 of, our, of my colleagues sign on with me. And so we had a forum where we could, uh, we, we could organize ourselves. And um, we sent a letter to him. And we got back a reply basically saying, it's not as important as you think. You know, just focus on what you've been told to do, which is to talk about energy. So I thought maybe I didn't study it enough, you know, so I need to go some more and, I, and maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. So I waited. And in 2009, I don't know, uh, do you all know about Goodland and Anhang's paper? So Goodland and Anhang wrote a paper saying that 51% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from animal agriculture. It created a big ruckus. Okay. And... Um, there was, there was a lot of debate about it on the internet and in various forums because people said these, these numbers are too outrageous, it cannot be true. So I waited until it got debated in um, peer-reviewed journals. So it got debated in peer-reviewed journals in 2011. In the Animal Feed Science and Technology Journal, the authors of the livestock uh, Long Shadow Report, they wrote a paper rebutting Goodland and Anand's work. And Goodland and Anand then responded to that. And point by point, they showed why they were correct. And the editor at that point asked the Livestock's Long Shadow authors to respond to Goodland and Anand's paper. And they declined to continue <coughs> that debate. So at that point, I knew that this was true. So I wrote to Mr. Gore again. 
and said, we need to talk about this. And this time I didn't get any reply. Okay, I didn't get any reply. Instead, they had a training for another, two th another thousand people in San Francisco in uh, December of 2012. And they found out that some protesters were going to show up with placards talking, I mean, asking him to talk about animal agriculture. So they contacted me right away and said, are you part of that? Okay, because I'm part of the climate project. So are you, are you part of the demonstration? And I said, no, I'm not. But I know the people who are demonstrating and they're making a valid point and you need to address it. So I was one of the mentors. I was one of those who was supposed to help the people who were being trained. So I went there. And uh, the first thing they did was to hand every one of the mentors a piece of paper saying, don't go out and talk to the protesters. You're forbidden to talk to the protesters. And I said, wait a minute. I'm coming here as a volunteer. I'm paying my way through. I'm paying for the hotel rooms. You cannot tell me what to do. So I immediately went out and talked to the protesters. <laughs> and I showed them the letter that they had given us, saying, you are making a difference. Right? They are scared of you. You are making a difference. So they immediately took a picture of that, of, that, of that piece of paper and they put it on Facebook. So everybody now got to know that it's up. So they called me in and they gave me the third degree. They said, if you ever go out and talk to the protesters again, we'll kick you out. And I said, I walk out. So I walked out. And it created a bit of a ruckus in the, because everybody knew that this was going on. And everybody knew, because my, the people that I was the mentor for all knew that I, I was walking out. So they all went and talked to the organizing systems. What is going on? Why aren't you talking about this? So, suddenly that entire um, three-day training became vegan. Okay? And then Mr. Gore decided to go vegan in January of 2013. But he still doesn't talk about it. So you wonder why. How many of you have seen Cowspiracy? Oh, quite a few. What was it? Cowspiracy. So I have it. I leave a copy of my books and, and this Cowspiracy here. So it's this documentary. Thank you. So whenever there is something that nobody wants to talk about, you can be sure that that is the crux of the problem. So, uh, so we decided to, and I wrote a couple of books, and I'll leave a copy, leave copies, a copy here, Carbon Dharma and Carbon Yoga, and then I, um, we, uh, we co-produced three documentaries. The first is called The Human Experiment, which talks about all the chemicals we are pouring into the environment. So there are 87,000 different chemicals that we are pouring into the environment, including some of the strongest carcinogens known to man, dioxins, uh, which come out of every waste incinerator on the planet and every paper mill on the planet. It's pouring dioxin into the atmosphere. And all those chemicals including what we put into the air, comes down in the rain. So it's in the water, it's absorbed by vegetation. And the animals are eating all that vegetation and they are storing all those toxins in their bodies. And we have a choice, either to eat the plants or the animals. When we eat the plants, we get toxins just like the animals do. But if we feed the animals, we get the toxins at thousand times the concentration. Now, trees are very good filters. So they filter these toxins, they store them in their trunks, and they purify the water before they create the fruit for us. So 
So we have a system that persuades us to eat more animal foods as we go up in the economic ladder. I mean, I see that in India. India, you know, we used to rarely eat any animal foods. Uh, I mean, even milk was rationed when I was growing up in India. But nowadays, everybody has cheese at every meal, or meat at every meal. And diabetes rates are going through the roof. Obesity rates are going through the roof. And, uh, you know, heart disease, cancers of all kinds. Because these toxins that we ingest in these animal foods are going to cause chronic diseases. So the second movie we did was Cospiracy, which showed that nobody wants to talk about this. And then the third movie we did was is called What the Health, that just got on Netflix last week. And thank you. And that shows that the pharmaceutical companies are all making money off of us as they fix our diseases. So there is a huge artificial growth in the economy that is caused by pouring toxins into the environment, making us eat the animal foods, and then fixing us. So that is this together, these three activities, there are about one and a half billion people employed. significant portion of the GDP is in, in these three activities. And this is why nobody wants to talk about it. Because it will crash the system. So Jeremy Lent wrote a book recently where he said there are only three possible futures for humanity. The first future is the total collapse of civilization, which nobody plans for that because it's just the system collapse. The second is what he calls a um, techno split, where there is an extreme inequality between the people who have everything and the people who don't have anything. And the third is the great transition, a great transformation of values. And there's only one thing that we should be all working towards, is the great transformation of values. Right? That should be where our focus is. And that's what I've been talking about now. I go around, I'm going to go around the country talking about this to people. And what we can do together to, to, to make this happen, this great transition. So I call this the transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly. And the foundation of that is going to be compassion. Compassion for all beings, you know, all life. Because that's at the core of our being, really. All of us are compassionate. So I was at a school in uh, Marrakesh where I asked the kids, there were about 250 kids in my audience. I asked them, so how many of you are vegan? And only one kid raised his hand. And it's clear that he had to raise his hand. Everybody knew he was vegan. They were all looking at him. <laughs> then I asked them, how many of you would deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? And no one raised their hands. There was one girl who was about to raise her hand, and her neighbor said, no, no, he meant the opposite. Put it down. <laughs> then I told them, by definition, all of you are vegan. Because that's the definition of veganism. Because in our heart, that's who we are. But our mind is telling us to do something else. So there's a disconnect between our heart and our mind. The disconnect between who we are and what we do. Which causes suffering for us. So anytime we are in misalignment, we cause suffering for ourselves. Right? So... So this is why I told the kids, you're all vegan, and you're all coming home to who you really are. And you're all in different places coming home to who you really are. And you'll have to find your own way. But don't ever give up. You may fall down somewhere, but just get up and keep coming. A lot of this is unfortunately systemic. 
Gus Pett, who is the founder of NRDC, uh, he said, 30 years ago I thought that the top three environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystems collapse, and climate change. And with 30 years of good science, we can solve these problems. I was wrong. The top three environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to solve them, you need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And these scientists don't know how to do that. But unfortunately, that selfishness and greed are systemic. It's not that people are selfish and greedy, it's just that the selfish and greedy among us are elevated in our system. So that they have access to more and more resources. And I, I like to tell a story. It's a story from um, the Vedic scriptures. Which talks about selfishness. So it is the equivalent of the knowledge tree story in the Bible. In the Bible we know the knowledge tree story. Adam and Eve pluck the apple and they eat the apple and they get banished from Eden. It's as if we are banished from Eden on earth. Right? So the equivalent story in the Veda is uh, starts with children playing with sticks and stones and rag dolls on the floor of their hut in the middle of the forest. And their uncle comes to visit them. And the uncle says, why are you playing with sticks and stones when the cosmic fig tree is right outside your hut? So go out under the tree and wish for anything you want and it will give it to you. Then you can be playing with real toys instead of these trifles. Children don't believe him. How can there be a tree like that? where you wish and it gives it to you. So they wait until the uncle leaves. Then they rush to the tree and they start wishing. They wish for sweets and they get them. And they gorge on the sweets and they get stomachache. They wish for toys and they get them. They play with the toys and they get bored. Fancier toys lead to greater boredom. So there was something about the tree that they did not understand. It grants you what you wish for and along with it comes the exact opposite. Because that's how the universe is built, of dualities. The children didn't know this. All they knew is that they couldn't stop wishing under the tree. And the more they wished, the more miserable they were. So then they get to be young men and women. And now they're wishing for what young men and women wish for. The, the, three main, the four main fruits of the tree were sex, fame, money and power. And with each comes its opposite. And the result was more misery and suffering for the young men and women. Then they get to be old men and women. And they congregate under the tree in three different groups. The first group says, you know, we were so happy when we didn't know about this tree. This tree ruined our lives. And the story says they were fools for they hadn't understood the tree. The second group says, we must have been wishing for all the wrong things. If you could go back and wish for different things, I'm sure we'd have been a lot happier. The story says they were bigger fools, but they understood less than nothing about this tree. And the third group was the most foolish of the lot, for they come under the tree and they say, we are so miserable, we wish you were dead. And the tree grants them the wish, and they're immediately reborn underneath the same tree. The tree always grants wishes in dualities. So meanwhile, a lame child had been watching all this from inside the window of the hut. He also wanted to go out and wish for a good leg so he could walk. But there was such a crowd of people thronging under the tree, they pushed him away. He couldn't get his way through. So he stood there and he watched. And he saw the tree was making everybody miserable. Not only the people who were wishing, the people who were trying to get to the tree were miserable. All the animals were suffering. Every, there was so much misery and suffering under the tree. So he began to feel a well of compassion come from within him for all that suffering. And with that he lost the desire to wish. He became detached from the tree. And with that combination of compassion and detachment, 
he was the happiest of the lot. So that's where the story ends. Then in the Upanishads, which is like a commentary on the Vedas, they say that the wishing child and the watching child are inside each one of us. That's the duality within us. Sounds like the sequel to the given tree. Yeah. <laughs> and the purpose of all meditation is to discriminate between your watching child and your wishing child. And to identify your watching child, stay with your watching child and say that that's really you and not your wishing child. But that would make it seem like you need to separate yourself from the universe and not participate in it. Right? So in the Bhagavad Gita, the same question comes up. You know, Arjuna asks Krishna, why should I participate in the universe? Why should I fight the battle? Why don't I just sit somewhere and meditate upon you and I'll be very happy? And Krishna says, no, you have to participate in the universe. Life is about action. And then he taught him how to participate in the universe, how to wish under the tree. See, those people were miserable because they were going under the tree and wishing for themselves. If you wish for the benefit of all life, and you say, I don't want anything from the tree for myself. So you become detached from the tree and you wish. Then you'll be perfectly happy wishing under the tree and everybody will be happy around you as well. So the lesson of, all religions teach us this lesson, okay? Every religion is that selflessness is the highest form of selfishness. It's, you know, rank selfishness is really a sign of ignorance. That you haven't understood that selflessness is the highest form of selfishness. So anyway, I'm going to stop here and let's have a discussion. I'd be happy to answer questions if you want. And it could be a free-flowing discussion as well. Well, I call what you said selflessness for to detach from something for myself actually a conscious self-interest. Mm -hmm. So that actually Absolutely. is a community conscious self-interest. So I, I desire peace for myself for sure. And the more peace that I can uh, exhibit, experience, and share, right. And it, 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 it's not, it doesn't hurt me Absolutely. to be, try to be as peaceful as I can. Right, right. And wish for that for others as well. The same thing happens, you know, when as a species, we are the only ones who have access to this tree. You know, we do a lot of things with our knowledge. We are the only species that can, get, that can organize in such large numbers and use our collective knowledge to create things, right? unlike any other species. That's why we dominate the other species. But if we are the only ones who have access to this tree, we should be wishing for the benefit of all other species using our knowledge. <clears throat> and that is the transformation that we are called to do now. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I don't think ego has any problem with wishing um, happiness to all around you. Because when the other around you are happy, you naturally fall into the happiness. Right. Right? So it's logical. It's just like science putting math. It's like two and two is four. Right. But there is a systemic barrier to it at the moment. Okay? Because well, of course, we have to see the barrier in order to break through it. Right. So we have to work. This is why we are also working on an alternate <coughs> system in parallel. It's just like what... Uh, um, but Mr. Fuller said, you know, I never fight the existing reality just to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So you have to build a new model in which we guarantee that all humans put together, our footprint does not exceed half the earth, so the other half can be given back to wildlife. And we consciously go and clean up the environment for them so that they can recover. And the new model is, and what is the new model? No, the new model is something that we have to work on. So what we are work, so we have we are working on the system design now, you know, of what it should be. Yes. So is your analogy in using the wishing tree as a model for what we're experiencing here in society? And I put this as in we have a mass amount of humans that seem to be crowding into the wishing tree and we have more people that are not able to get in. Right. And those are the ones that we're hoping learn 
to see things from the perspective of the lame boy, mm -hmm. but yet we have this mass of people inside the tree still. Right. How do we, or how, how does that story play out in terms right. of how do they get helped? Is it from right. the outside in? From the outside, in, <laughs> yes. Yeah. They'll get help from the outside in. Initially, I mean, they will resist, right? So they, they did resist initially, right? But now I think they're getting overwhelmed. You know, when we first supported conspiracy, my wife was very concerned. She said, they're, they're going to throw you in jail, you know, because you're, throwing, you're putting money into this documentary. Um, or they could kill you, right? So, but we said, we have to do it. There's no other way. As the, I mean, the, the truth has to come out. So, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, um, you, you, you called it the 2026 tour. Right. So, why? Oh, yeah. It's not, okay. it's Sorry, not I, that year. It's in the future. Right, right. The 2026. The so, I call it the Vegan World 2026 tour. And I'll tell you why I, I came up with that number. So, um, in 2014, there was a report by the World Wildlife Fund, which has been tracking about 3,400 uh, vertebrate species since 1970. Wow. So this is a fairly comprehensive survey, uh, including vertebrates in, on land, in the air, uh, in the ocean, and in fresh water, all put together. And they said that between 1970 and 2010, 52% of all those wild vertebrates died in terms of the total biomass. So different, um, I mean, I think freshwater was the worst. We had lost 78% by then. Then uh, I did a quick calculation. Between 1970 and 2010, human population doubled. And, in, and, and human per capita consumption also doubled. So overall, our impact on the environment quadrupled in those 40 years. <coughs> so if you take an exponential curve that has gone up by a factor of four in 40 years, and you extrapolate that out, you say, how many more years do we have left before we wipe them all off the face of the earth? And that turned out to be 16 years. By, <coughs> by 2026, we wipe them out. Okay? I was so shocked by that, that say, can I be true? Why isn't anybody talking about this? Why aren't ecologists talking about this? So I looked up all the, the ecology models. What are they using as a model for biodiversity loss? And they were using a predator-prey model. And in a predator-prey model, what happens is, as the prey population declines, the predator population also declines. So less and less predators are there. So then there is a balance that so comes back again. So you go up and down like that, right? But then I realized that human beings are not ordinary predators. Our population did not decline, even though our prey population declined. We are actually deploying software and GPS technology and big data software to track all those fishes and kill them and eat them. If you look at a fishing industry um, console, it looks like a mission to Mars, you know, like monitors all over. They're monitoring every area of the ocean to see where the fish are. And they're being subsidized by the government to do this. Right? So the way we are doing it, it's going to be grab, 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 and then that's where you're headed for total collapse, right? So I thought, even though you know maybe there is something I'm missing, so I'm going to wait and see the next World Wildlife Fund report. Because if my prediction is correct, then next year it's going to be three percent less at least, and then another three percent. And sure enough, in 2016 December, it was last year. The World Wildlife Fund report came out stating that between 1970 and 2012, 58% died off. So is that 58% the population of 
different species or the actual species themselves? The total biomass. The, the total they, biomass. The total so biomass. Not, did you, how many species have gone, been ex, gone extinct? Extinction is a different issue. I mean, that's like a, over 100 of them are going extinct every day, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is the total biomass. So it's, the, it's the biodiversity abundance mm -hmm. that we are wiping out. And those are vertebrates. Yeah. They, were, they were looking at only vertebrates, yeah. but, you know, it, I think the others are probably just mm -hmm. in proportion. So anyway, uh, so it confirmed to me that it is going down. Uh, at 3% per year, so which means we're going to wipe them all out by 2026. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know about St. Matthew's Island and what happened in St. Matthew's Island in Alaska? Mm -hmm. So St. Matthew's Island in Alaska, the U.S. Army went and introduced like 27 reindeer in 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, 21 females and 6 males or something like that. And this was just so that the reindeer could multiply on the island and whenever they needed meat during the war, the soldiers could go and grab a reindeer and eat, right? That was the idea. But they didn't need the meat during the war, so they just forgot about it. And there were no predators on the island for the reindeer. So by 1961 or 62, it had become like 1,500 reindeer on the island. And then it increased like 6,000 reindeer. And then the next year it was 42 reindeer. So all the 6,000 reindeer got together and they ate up all the vegetation on the island and they starved to death. Right? So that's what happens to reindeer. And that's where we are headed if we continue like this. See, I use the analogy of a weightlifter. So imagine a weightlifter who is lifting five times his weight above his head, discovers that he's on quicksand and he's sinking. What is the first thing he should do if he knows he's sinking? and he knows that his weight alone is too much for the quicksand to bear, what is the first thing he should do? Drop the weight. Drop the weight. <coughs> See, our, we are eating, so the, our population alone, 7.4 billion people, we weigh about 500 million metric tons, 68 kgs per person on the average. Okay? The total weight of all the wild megafauna from 10,000 years ago was 200 million metric tons. So our species, one species alone, is two and a half times the weight of all the wild animals from 10,000 years ago. So, we know that the wildlife is dying in front of our eyes. So we know that we are on ecological quicksand. But on top of our weight, we are procuring five times as much food for our farmed animals. Unnecessarily. So that's the weight we are carrying around, unnecessarily. So that clearly is the first thing we need to do, to so drop it. Yes? Well, perhaps there's actually something even more fundamental, potentially, mm -hmm. uh, that is even, even less talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mentioned that you know, the reindeer, they multiplied so much, and um, then they collapsed. Right. But, I mean, if the reindeer population had stayed steady, there would be no problem. And you mentioned that between 1970 and 2010, human population doubled. Right. I mean, isn't the more fundamental problem population growth even? Right. And you know, if you're not having any children, then you're really not um, uh, you know, introducing any more meat eaters into the planet. Right. Good point. You know, but uh, if you look at population itself, why is it growing? There is, there is an impetus for growth in the economy, in the way our system is structured, our economic system is structured, okay? That forces the poor people to multiply because they are the ones who are providing the fodder for the whole economy. It's like a huge Ponzi scheme. Mm. Okay? It's an ecological Ponzi scheme and you need to grow the base for the Ponzi scheme to keep growing. Otherwise the whole thing collapses. So population growth is also systemic in this growth oriented system. So I imagine, you know, I, uh, in my book, I write about something called the Ahimsa coin economy, which is an alternate way of organizing ourselves. Where we give each of us, because we are all passengers on spaceship Earth, we give each of us a mileage program. So every one of us gets a new coin in our account every 50 minutes we are alive. And this coin entitles us 
to one square meter of the Earth's surface productivity for one year. This is a, like a distributed currency system. Okay? As soon as you have security, you automatically have less children. When I go ask the people in India, you know, the village people who are having five or six kids, why do you have so many kids? Because clearly they are, they are hurting. They, it's just security. There are kids dying from snake bites. There are kids dying from crazy diseases that they had never heard of. Right? And they don't know how many of them are going to survive. And they're saying, you know, I want to make sure there's somebody around when I'm, when I'm old to take care of me. Right. And the other hand, though, I mean, it's actually children in the West who have much greater footprint than Absolutely. the children in India. Absolutely. So if you look at sheer numbers, mm -hmm. you'll be talking about the children in the East, in the global South. If you look at the total footprint, consumption, you'll be talking about children in the West, right, in the mm -hmm. global North. So, but, so this is why consumption is where we need to tackle, and we need to change the system uh, that, that we're organized around. So that there is equality and sustainability built in from the outset in our system. Yeah, because going back to your analogy, cutting population is just treating the fever again. It has to do more with how we use resources, um, how we occupy this planet, because there is provable models that even the population we have right now is completely sustainable and can even grow even past where we're at if we actually use resources properly if we actually adopted more sustainable practices. Right, but given the fact that we're not doing that, right. Right. Um, then it's pretty important to reduce the population while we're not doing that. Maybe it's fine to increase the population once everybody's living nicely sustainably. Because but while we're not doing that, maybe the most important thing is actually to reduce the population. See, yeah, as uh, in the weightlifters analogy that I gave, population reduction is like asking the weightlifter, before you drop the weight, slim down, <laughs> you know? get a liposuction or something quickly so that you reduce your weight. <laughs> it's, it's something that he will have to do eventually, but first thing is to drop the weight, mm -hmm. right? Then we'll figure this out, yeah. Um, one of the things I was going to bring up is that Jamshed and I have both been discussing an idea of a 21st century definition of veganism, mm -hmm. which goes beyond <clears throat> mere diet. Absolutely. Uh, and addresses things like having children, discusses things like uh, fossil fuel consumption, deforestation aside from growing food, uh, because all of these things contribute, even if they don't contribute as much as diet, they still have a contribution. So yeah. the analysis that I've done of them, not as much as you, similar, is that 21 gigatons worldwide are produced by livestock, mm -hmm. and a little over 7 is produced by the world's transportation. That's not to say that uh, it, it's clear that uh, diet is the much larger issue, Right. but it's also that it's important to understand that all of these other issues are also, including Absolutely. having children, I believe, are also a big contributor. Absolutely. See, every act of consumption does hurt some animal somewhere. Right. So this is why every act of consumption has to be on a need basis. In the sense, that's where we will all eventually get to, as if we follow the vegan path. Right? We'll eventually get to that. We'll simplify our lives. Automatically. It's happened to me, at least. You know? I, I would disagree that in the West, that in... Mm. You know, in vegan groups here, there's a lot of people who will go to take out food, they'll get vegan food, but it comes in a plastic container, or they'll drive across town to a vegan restaurant. Right. Uh, I think that that's why addressing this idea of, of lower consumption from a holistic standpoint, not right. specifically from a vegan standpoint, is worthwhile. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes? What about the other side, which uh, they're making all these assumptions that it's possibly sustainable now, or at least it could be sustainable, the population that we have now. But what about putting in the uh, depredation part with the uh, destruction of our ecosystems? Mm -hmm. Every single place that we're farming on right now is literally losing its biomass to the point that it's not going to be as sustainable as it was. Right. Which means, are they putting in that into account <coughs> that we've destroyed almost three-fourths of our land already? Right. right. That gets back to the system he's talking about. The system has to be changed. Right. That's yeah. How they're doing it right now. Right. It can be done. Yeah, yeah, it has to be, it be done, yeah. but they'd have to completely change the entire system. They'd have to right. take out oil. They would have to uh, right. put the production a lot closer. Mm -hmm. It would have to probably be even more condensed onto a closer uh, space. Right, right. So it's really going from a voice. I mean, I use my the analogy that I'm aware of. 
going from a voice telephone network, mm -hmm. dial tones and all that, to the internet. Mm -hmm. To what? The, to the internet, to a the data internet. network like the internet. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of transformation in human civilization that has to happen. Okay. The voice network was completely top down. AT&T had 104 computers. That's it. That was routing the entire call. Everybody. Wow. Okay. Everybody was going through 104 computers, and there was one computer that was that's job was to route everybody's calls, figure out exactly which which switch is turned on to go connect you from here to there. Right. And so it was a completely top-down network. Everything was top-down. And they came to the internet committee meetings. And they said, we have a network that works great. Let's use the same architecture for internet. It has to be a top-down. So every time you click on a link, they wanted us to first send a packet to a central computer that would tell you exactly how your click is going to go to that website. And they thought, if they did that, you know, it can be done, it will optimize the network, and they can then send you billing, you know, all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. right? And there was an alternate protocol called Ethernet at that point. So, so what they were proposing was called ATM, and what the alternate protocol was called Ethernet. And Ethernet was free for all. You plug, and you become a node on the network, and you do your routing yourself, right? So everything, it was completely distributed. It's a scale-free network. And it just took off. As soon as we showed a few of these working, people were buying more Ethernet cards and sticking it in there. And the Internet just blew up. It didn't take much time. In 1995, well, I, I was thinking maybe I should stop working on the Internet because I don't know if it's going anywhere. There was, there was, yeah, there was an article in Newsweek saying it's going nowhere. Who's going to buy books on the internet? Who's going to read newspapers on the internet? It's going nowhere. And ten years later, I overheard someone say, I can't imagine living without the internet. And I went to him and said, dude, you didn't even know it existed ten years ago. <laughs> and you can't even live without it. <laughs> right? So it completely changed our lives. That's what we need to do now. So should we break the system? Because um, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the first time, sorry, I come from a very small country, so it's difficult to understand the scale of the problem. But once I came here to Oregon, and uh, I guess I went on this job in the car. Sorry, uh, <laughs> so, so I went around and, and I saw that you know I went to southern Oregon. So I went through entirety of Oregon, and I saw that almost everywhere we went was devoted to rearing animals. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I've heard that, you know, the government, it's, it's government land, and they, they right. give it for free to the, to the farmers. Right. But I just didn't realize how much of the entirety of Oregon was, was devoted to that, and, and basically, in my perspective, wasted. Right. So and, and as you said, you know, if, if we if we change that, you know, the system would break. So right. some people reckon I mean we have this anarchist group saying, you know, we should break the system. But what do you think? Well, I, I wouldn't devote any time consciously to trying to break that system. I I want to focus on building a new one. Building a new one and making an open source uh, new civilization, right? All the software and hardware infrastructure that you need for creating this new uh, way of living, and make that available, and so people can copy it, and you know, and modify it, and evolve it, and so th and and then join the network, so that eventually the old just crumbles on its own, as opposed to us going and trying to break it. Internet took like 40 years to, uh, to, to materialize. Uh, we don't have that time. Well, Internet took, but, but you know, I think we are in the same 
time as the 1995 of the internet, you know, meaning uh, I really believe that in 10 years we will, we will be in a completely different world, okay? Because that's how fast things change these days. Gandhi, okay, Gandhi created the Kadi movement in 12 years. He made the British, the British were on their knees begging to negotiate, negotiate with him in 1931. And the Kadi movement started in 1919. He did it in 12 years. He got 100 million, uh, 150 million Indians to start wearing just Kadi clothes and ditching all their British clothes. And the British textile mills went bankrupt. Because they were the largest customers for the British textile mills. And he, how did he do it? He went around by foot talking to people. He convinced enough people to walk around and talk to people. He went by train to talk to people. We've got the internet, we've got, you know, I mean, we can reach millions instantly. So things are happening much, much faster. Of course, they, they also have the internet, so. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, so they are trying to convince everybody to go eat meat. Yeah, but people are falling sick, the so. Internet too. Right? Yeah, so it's like, so it's, both sides have the, had the amplification of the internet. It's how much effort we are putting into it. So this is my job. I'm going to go around talk to be, talking to people, trying to convince all of us to become leaders in our own community, to go and you know, talk to people and get them to change. Because just like the Kadi movement, the vegan movement is the Kadi movement of the 21st century. Yes. Do you have any more specific uh, visions on practical things that we can all do? What, what do you think are the best strategies going forward for our community development? Community development, it is uh, growing your own food, which obviously you're doing here, you know, and growing your own food and um, creating community around food. So, like in Phoenix, we have a community kitchen that works uh, every, every Monday we have community dinner. So the community comes together and we, we uh, uh, it's a buffet dinner with about 15 dishes, uh, and then uh, we clean up afterwards. So we wash the dishes, we we talk, we strategize, and uh, and then once a month we party. So we have uh, the last Friday of every month we have what is called Zen Night. The people come together and we have costumes and things and we dance around. That's called Zen, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice new, yeah. new way of zen. doing Zen, yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's all vegan, you know, completely vegan. So it's the vegan community coming together and forming, so forming community around food. What's the name of your, what is the name of that group? You, this is your group that you founded, or? No, in Phoenix. Oh, yeah. In Phoenix, it's called community, yourcommunitycook.com, has the community dinner. So then lots of people are doing different things and I'm just walking around talking to people and trying to coordinate, that's all. Yeah. yeah. And so Zen Night was started by Nadia Kaligi, who uh, I think she turned vegan a year ago. And she's so passionate about it, she said, you know, I need to, I need to make it fun. <laughs> yes? Um, actually, I want to note a few things um, that I noticed. One is that most of the people in this room are men. And the second thing is that every single person who has spoken so far has been male. Um, and the third thing is that most of the questions that I've noticed um, seem to be like, well, what about this problem? Or don't you think that such and such? Um, and I think we want those questions because a lot of us feel pretty afraid and insecure and maybe we're wanting some reassurance or we're wanting some certainty that yeah, we can do this. Um, and so with all of that in mind, my personal request is that, um, uh, is that if that those of us who have questions try to focus it more on you know, this is a rare opportunity. You're, you're only in town here, briefly. Um, so a lot of this discussion maybe we can have on our own, but I'm really interested in um, what you can share with us that's unique. Um, and I'd love to hear more questions that's maybe unique to his experience. Um, and my second request, um, 
is that if, like me, you identify as male, that maybe you abstain and I'd love to hear some women speak and uh, anyone else who feels like a bit of an outsider. And my question to you is going to be, as you go around uh, and speak to people, what kind of audiences do you plan to visit? Are you sending out letters requesting to speak at universities, to, you know, ecology students, things like that? That seems like uh, a way to influence the younger generation. Right, or are so you just going to groups that already care about this? Uh, my first tour is going to be... It's at least uh, the, my first tour is to people who care about this, so I'm mm -hmm. addressing all the vegan spirituality groups around the country, uh, and I'm visiting them and talking to them first. Then I'll go around again, you know, um, as necessary. 80% uh, of vegans are women. This is a women's revolution that's happening. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a women's revolution that's happening. So, and, you know, Women are at the forefront of this, okay? And it is transforming. See, I, because I call this the caterpillar turning to the butterfly because the caterpillar has no choice but to become a butterfly, number one. And number two, the caterpillar was essential for the butterfly to be born. So what we had to do was essential for our next phase. Okay? So this way they are not sitting around blaming anybody. And, uh, and I'm thankful to my granddaughter for making me see it this way. So I was really depressed in 2009 because I, uh, uh, I thought that we were going to part. I mean, we were going to help. The thing was so screwed up that there is no way out. Okay, and um, I was visiting a, a sanctuary in the Western Ghats of India. And it was a beautiful sanctuary with animals, birds, insects. At night, I couldn't even hear my sister talk because there was such a loud din of insects around us. It's full of life, okay? full of life. You cannot believe that any place could have so much life wandering around, you know, hanging around. And. Uh, I asked the, I mean, I felt a sense of perfection in that forest. So I asked the owners of the sanctuary, how did you do this? It was a private sanctuary. How did you do this? <coughs> this was a couple from New Jersey who came and did this. And they said all they had to do was to tear down the fences and let it go. It used to be a coffee plantation. I said, that's it? They said, no, on top of that, we had to patrol the land and make sure that no human being comes inside. And I felt so small at that point because I was born in that forest. So it's as if I don't belong in my own birthplace, you know. Then a year later, my granddaughter was born in Phoenix. And she's half Indian one quarter African and one quarter American Indian. Three continents in her, in one girl. I wasn't there when she was born. I was in, the, in San Francisco. My wife left immediately to see her. Then she came back and then she left again in a week later. She came back and then she told me that there's something about this girl, you have to go see her. There's something special, something magical about her. So I went. She was about a month old, and I held her in my arms, and I had this exact same feeling of perfection that I had at that sanctuary. So I said, she must belong exactly as she is, and we all must belong exactly as we are, right? Because just like the elephant just routinely does things, and it helps the forest. The elephant doesn't know it's helping the forest. The elephant is eating a jackfruit, the ripe jackfruit. It puts the whole 
The elephant puts the whole jackfruit in her mouth. It's a huge fruit. Have you ever seen a jackfruit? It's huge. And so and the elephants walk about 100 miles a day. So they're pooping these jackfruit seeds all over the place. Along with the jackfruit seeds are the manure for the jackfruit to grow, tree to grow. So new trees are born everywhere. So the elephant breaks a branch of a tree, eats the leaves and throws the branch away. And it creates an opening. Otherwise, the forest the cover is so dense that there is no sunlight streaming through. Without the elephant, there is no sunlight for the bottom, for the shrubbery underneath. So the elephant is absolutely essential for that forest. But everything the elephant does routinely helps the forest. So why do we think that we are separate and we are different and we are special and we don't belong like that? So I told a story in, in Carbon Yoga and Carbon Dharma of how we belong exactly as we are. We have been creating technology. So we have been in this growth phase. We have been producing technology like crazy, right? But as part of a larger purpose. And now we have been asked to change. We have been told, this is the time, you know, switch over and become compassionate and take care of all life. It's better to do it here than to kill everything here and then go to Mars and try to do it there. You know, that's stupid. <coughs> right? So, because there are, I don't know, there are like 200,000 people who have applied to go to Mars. Did you know that? <laughs> so it's so silly, right? Why would we want to do that? There's plenty here. That, I mean, it's so much easier to make it happen here. So that's the story I've, uh, I've come up with, you know, based on, um, and she just pulled me out from my depression, put me on the other side and said, look this way. And I could see the patterns, you know, and it's beautiful. Yes, Daniel. In, uh, I was reading the part of your book Carbon uh, Dharma last weekend, where you spoke about the, the fig tree. Mm -hmm. Somewhere near that, you were talking about, and, and this was where I really felt the uniqueness of your perspective, you spoke about how certain words that we use all the time in English, like compassion mm -hmm. and um, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That these words, there's an original meaning to these words that we have lost such that there is no accurate way to translate them quite. And yet, I felt like you were doing that for me. Can you speak a little to this? Yeah, so, um, when we say words, What do we mean by it, right? I mean, it's, it's how are we interpreting those words? Words are a story. Every word is a story. And uh, like I, the compassion, for instance. I was in, you know, in, in Durban, South Africa. We, there were 40 interfaith leaders there, faith leaders. And we signed a, dec a declaration Interfaith Declaration on Climate Change, and we presented it to the UN Executive Secretary, uh, Christiana Figueres. They basically said, while climate change is a symptom, the fever that our Earth has contracted, the underlying disease is the disconnection from creation. And we, the undersigned, pledge to heal this disconnection by promoting and exemplifying compassion for all creation in all our actions. In all our actions. And everybody signed it, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Then I got a call a week later from uh, Desmond Tutu's secretary saying that Desmond is concerned that he signed this, uh, this declaration because 
he loves his chicken. <laughs> and did he sign on to go vegan by signing this? And I said, who am I to tell Desmond Tutu what it is that he signed? Right? He needs to make that interpretation. He needs to come to that realization himself. I cannot force him. But that's the play on words, right? So we say compassion and then compassion for all creation, but we say food is exempted from that. What really got me in that section was that you said that the way compassion is used among most of us, or I, this is a broad us, Western world, is includes pity mm -hmm. and tol toleration. Right. I've used the word compassion a lot, and it really got me thinking. Thank you for being open to hear that. In the description of how this re relates to Gandhi and the Kali movement, I wondered, was that, in your we don't know that much about Gandhi, in this <laughs> was that a, did he, was he a catalyst or was there a lot of strategy? Was there a lot of planning? Or was it an, an organic kind of thing? That, like the butterfly, I mean, do we need a lot of strategy here now? Do, or, are we, or is this a natural evolving process where we all just take part? I'm, I'm worried about the messy part in between our, the goal and, and the where we are now, of right. all the things that have to take place. Right, right. And I wondered how much we have to plan for that, or if it just is or the pressure of, of all the change going on at once. See, Gandhi was basically an accidental leader. Um, people didn't know about Gandhi in India in the early 20th century. He was an activist in South Africa, not in India. So he was fighting for, you know, against apartheid in South Africa. And uh, he, was, uh, he had traveled to London and on the way back from London to South Africa on the ship, he was having a conversation with a fellow passenger. And the fellow passenger was asking him questions and Gandhi was answering them. And somebody just, I mean, took notes. Okay? Took notes. And so they had this Q&A, which they organized by sections into chapters. And they said, you know, this looks like a nice book. And so Gandhi decided to publish that book. It was called Hind Swaraj. And when the British government read that book, they banned it in India. As soon as they banned it, it became an instant bestseller. <laughs> Everybody copied it, translated it into every language, and Gandhi's name just, you know, went like wildfire. Everybody knew who he was by that time. All the intellectuals knew who he was. So when he landed in India in 1915 January, he was already well known because of the Hinswaraj. Okay, so he had a voice, and uh, he traveled the villages of India for three or four years before he started the Kali movement. And at first, you know, you can read the newspaper clippings from those days; people are laughing at him. I said what? You were talking about fighting the mightiest empire the world had ever seen by changing your clothes. What a crazy man he is, right? Uh, so, and that, it grew organically at that point. He had just had an idea. You know, maybe if you try Kadi, it will work. Then he tried all kinds of other things, right? He had the salt satyagraha. He, he did, it was all organic. It was all based on whatever the, the British were responding to him and he was responding back. And uh, unfortunately, I think eventually the British won. Even though India got independence, the British really did win. They partitioned India into two, made us fight each other, and uh, turned that into an industrial country as opposed to Gandhian country. So Gandhi tried a broken man, literally. So Gandhi was 
So with the making of all these documentaries and everything, do you feel like what he was saying that eventually it's going to be the snowball that just right. an awareness happens and a lot of it, the change will happen on its own? Well, that's, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen on its own. We are trying to trigger the change by raising the awareness yeah. of people, you know, because I fundamentally believe that people are good. You know, this is why the good will eventually triumph. I have no doubt about it. Because I've asked so many people, you know, the same question that I asked the kids, and not a single person has said they, they would hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily. So we are all, I tell everybody, you're all vegans at heart. Is that what we are, who we are and what we do are not in alignment. You know? And that's about coming into alignment. And we are all on our way home. Going vegan is about coming home to who you are. You know? And do you think it will get to the point where, you know, if, if people choose to eat meat, they will be seen as like you know, someone who chooses to smoke nowadays is kind of considered kind of, you it'll know. It would be worse. You no know better. <laughs> it would be worse. It's like someone who's eating, he's, he's a cannibal now, you know. When you would look at him and say, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, it'll Good. get there. I hope so. Yeah, it'll get there. Because, you know, eventually it'll get there. It's not right away, but eventually it'll get there. Because it's, it's there's, a, there's a snowball effect now about veganism. I mean, when I went vegan, nobody, you know, 2008, right? 2008, I could barely get soy milk in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. We look at it, I mean, this is just amazing what has happened, right, in the last nine years. And, and it's not going to stop. It is going to keep growing. So we have another documentary called The Compassion Project that's going to come out uh, <coughs> beginning of next year, where we are, we are interviewing a lot of religious leaders and asking them about compassion and how does veganism relate to that compassion. I'm sorry, you said another documentary? Mm -hmm. Great called The Compassion Project. And then Kip and Keegan are working on two other documentaries. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's going to keep coming. It's going to keep coming. And um, eventually, I think people will get it. Yeah, the documentaries are so powerful. Right. I, I asked, was talking with a woman last night who said, you got to watch this. And at 12.30, she texted me and said, I want to become vegan. With your help. I mean, so it's, yeah, I'm going to have a high tea for non vegans, all vegan in a couple of weeks. Definitely going to be promoting what the help. I mean, it's so powerful. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you know, the structure has to change as well. Yeah. Right? So the structure yeah. of our system has to change. So we have to produce this alternate system that anybody can take and replicate. So this scale-free network, so to speak. Because they tried to impose it from the top down and it, it, I mean, clearly it was a disaster. This is like replacing the voice network with another top-down internet model. It doesn't work. Yes? So as you, you say that food is is missing from the framework of what we see as compassionate behavior. But I think our clothing is, mm -hmm. our transport is, mm -hmm. our entertainment is, right. our tr uh, so many aspects of our life are right. not different. Food isn't different. It's part of Absolutely. And that's why I think it's really important that these aspects are addressed in veganism. Absolutely, you're right. But right now, what is happening? I mean, right now, 99% of the animals that are being killed are being killed for food, right? But then they are being used for other things also. The, all the leftovers from our food. So there's, there's this huge block diagram that the IPCC has done about what happens in our food system, what happens in our land use, for our land use. And you can see the big, big arrows of our food and then these little arrows go for other things. Mm -hmm. But you're right, all of them have to be addressed eventually. And I think, I think Jump Shade is including not just the animals are used for other things besides food, but our industrial systems. Right. Levels of consumption take so much land. Right. Industry takes so much land. It pollutes the land. Right. Like so many more animals, particularly wildlife, are dying Absolutely. in vast numbers for reasons even beyond food. Food is Absolutely. a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we are polluting their water. They, there's nothing to drink for them, you know? So, yeah. But right. the, the space that we're taking up 
is is pushing out other animals from living in that space. Right. I think you mentioned that the the average house in North America in the, in the USA has increased nearly threefold since right. 1950. Right. Right. Um, the average occupation, because right. you know, there's, right. there's large houses that are around in Portland that are 100 years old, but right. families used <coughs> to live in them and now one or two people live in them. Okay. But you know, uh, the good news though is that 35% of the land area of the planet is currently used just to raise, to graze livestock. I mean, graze farmed animals. And uh, we know that if just that land is returned back to the forests that used to be there in 1800, we can sequester more carbon than we have added to the atmosphere since 1750. Just by bringing back the original forest. I'm not saying it's easy to bring back the original forest, but if we do it, we will reverse climate change. Just on that land, the grazing land, okay? leaving all other land, the industrial use lands, leaving them alone, the same, right? You can do that. But of course, we have to start shrinking all that. You know, there is a book by Donella Meadows, who is a system scientist from MIT. And she analyzed human activities today. All of our activities put together, what each one of us do. And she estimated that 99% of human activities today are unnecessary and wasteful. Can you imagine that? I mean, people are dying, you know, saying, I spent my whole name? life doing unnecessary and wasteful things. <laughs> What's her name again? Donnell and Meadows. Uh, it's, it's called the, it's the Limits to Growth 40th year, revisited 40 years later or something like that, you know, or 30 years later. So, uh, and you, you can see that, right? I mean, the, uh, the human experiment, cowspiracy, and what the hell is put together. That entire industry is unnecessary and wasteful. Pouring toxins into the environment, making people eat animal foods, and then fixing them with pharmaceuticals. Hmm. Completely unnecessary and wasteful. Yes? I have a question that comes forward. You were saying that uh, the amount that so far that actually is a raise, the animals are being raised on is what? You were saying like 35? 35% of the land area. 35%? Of the land and then you're saying that uh, to sequester the carbon, you're saying that we should put that land in the forest. Yeah, so what we did in the analysis was take the 35% of the grass, the grasslands on the planet and return them back to a forest if they used to be a forest in 1800. So we have uh, data on where the forests were in 1800. Mm -hmm. okay. And so just replacing it with that original forest that was there we calculated how much extra carbon gets sequestered. And it turned out that only 41% of that land used to be forest in 1800, of the grasslands. So it's really 41% of 35% that becomes forest in the analysis. Okay? So that's, I think, 16% of 14% of the land area of the planet becomes forest. So we'd be having to farm off of 16% uh, of 35%? I have a similar question. Um, the, Let uh, me just address yeah, this, this question yeah, first. I, I think I want to clarify. Yeah. Like we're talking, we're also talking it's about any food forest. production of any kind. So, yeah. so that includes growing, growing plants, right. growing, growing crops. Right. Not instead of growing animals. Like if we stop growing animals, we're going to need to replace that with, with plant-based. Right. So right now, what's happening is that ten percent of the land area of the planet is used for, as cropland. Yeah. Okay. 35% is used as grazing land for, for animals, farmed animals. Now, of the 10% that's used for croplands, uh, half of its output is going straight to feed animals. So the animals together, they're eating about 7.27 gigatons of dry matter biomass, which is, take all the water out and just, you know, condense it and you weigh it. So they're eating 7.27 gigatons of dry matter biomass every year. All of us put together, we're eating 1.54 gigatons. Human beings. So from the 7.27 gigatons that you're feeding the animals, we get 0 0.18 gigatons of animal foods. So of the 1.54, only 0 0.18 is from animals. 
So, I mean, this is like the most inefficient way to feed ourselves, right? It's like a 40 to 1 reduction that happens, 39 to 1 reduction that happens. So if you wanted to replace that 0.18 with plant foods directly, you, you can do it with just the crop plants we have now. Okay? And I bet you you can do it with the crop plants we have now and make it completely organic and you'll get just as much food if not more food. Because right now we are using chemical fertilizers and we are just destroying the... Uh, I mean, we are making a mess. Yeah, but it's... But you can see there's so much waste, there's such waste, that you know that you can manage this much better and, and give enough room for the animals to come back. You know? So we just took the grasslands and said, return it back to forest if it can be returned to forest in the model. So this was the work that we did with the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, Professor Atul Jain. And so he has this integrated science assessment model where he just took the grasslands and replaced it with the, with the uh, native forest that used to be there in 1800. And he was so shocked, he said, there must be something wrong with this number. So he called me and he said, my grad student came up with a number, but I want to double check it. So he double checked it and he said, it's right. You can sequester 265 gigatons of carbon just in recovering forests. And we have added 240 gigatons of carbon since 1750 into the atmosphere. Because on land, currently there is three times as much carbon as in the atmosphere. And so nature has been, even, even though we've been pumping up fossil fuels and burning them and sending them into the air, nature has been figuring out how to fix it. You know, she's been sequestering, she's been putting it in the, in the Arctic. Uh, but we are, at the, we are near close to a bunch of tipping points. So we really have to change very quickly now. But if we change quickly, we have the possibility of reversing things so that tipping points can be avoided. So these forests come back really fast. You know, like um, I show in my presentations, I show what happens in just four years in India. A lot of these places like India and Africa, just things just grow on their own. Because the land is still very fertile. Monsanto hasn't come there yet. So they haven't been pouring glyphosate all over, killing the soil. How about indigenous cultures that have, like, uh, the Maasai of Africa? Mm -hmm. um, for centuries have been cattle herds right. and in the Rift Valley where they dwell, they've been herding cattle and it, and it, it has changed the land now depends on the cattle right. for eco ecological health because they, they not only poop but for the grasses but they, they their hooves turn up the soil and Allows right. the seeds, and they keep keep right. it grazed, right. so that it's just everything's in balance. Right. So you have these cultures that have depend on meat as their main sustenance, mm -hmm. and should they, shouldn't they just be allowed to continue? Uh, because there's, there's I'll leave it to the Maasai to figure this out. Okay, <laughs> but but if they are uh, using cell phones, which they are, and if they are wanting to join this new system, they'll mm -hmm. have to abide by it. But otherwise, they can figure it out, figure out how, they live, how they want to live on their own. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to tell indigenous cultures how to live or anyone else. I want to just talk to people who have choices today mm -hmm. and convince them with the choices we have today, we can make a huge difference mm -hmm. to how we live on Earth. You know? and, and we can do that in a way that others may say, we all want to be like that. I'd rather join that than stay where we are. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say to you that mm -hmm. I would wonder about like the natural succession of that land and whether that was always grassland right. or whether the natural succession would eventually just turn to forest anyway. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then that made me think about actually migratory. I got really mad 
when Aaron is talking, or no, right, when Aaron or Alex is talking, because, um, I, well, because it was addressed that, you know, eating animals is the, like, the most important step we can take for change, and, like, cars kind of, the humans in the West are really, really attached to cars, and I find that disturbing, because, the re like, ev even if, like, everybody start stopped eating animals, and they were forests again, and, you know, blessings from the universe provided that there were an wild animals that were free living in those forests again, mm -hmm. cars disrupt migratory patterns. Mm -hmm. They kill the world highways yeah. too. And the, the animals, like, the, to me, I mean, my only hope for humans is actually that we live where our food is again, like the rest of the animals do on Earth that right. haven't been manipulated by humans. Right. Yeah. I think that you know, eventually there'll be a lot less. Why, why are they rushing around yeah. different places, right? Eventually we'll, we won't have to. To rush, yeah. yeah. A lot of it is make work, right? Unnecessary work. A lot of things that we have to do, we don't do. We yeah. have to clean up the ocean. We, have, we are not doing that. Yeah, and I really love that you and Satya asked you what were practical things we could do that both of them were the biggest change that I can actually see, which is that if we do have a community and we are eating in a beautiful and passionate way, I don't think we're going to want to like we won't have the jobs that people have that are producing all the consumption and problems and pollution anymore. Mm -hmm. And that we can go back to like what Jamshed is wishing for, which is a more simplified way of living on Earth. And like, I don't know how that fits into like having technological gadgets or like right. yeah. in that in no. that sense right. because there is a lot of pollution in producing right. those right. as well. And right. But there is a lot of uh, research being done now on creating um, more biodegradable versions of technology. <laughs> uh, but this is like uh, uh, carbon-based batteries and uh, using carbon as the base for, for electronics as opposed to silicon, you know, things like that, which so far people said it's not, it's not cost effective at the moment. Don't put money into it. Don't put money into it because we can just pour the toxins out there in Malaysia. Nobody cares. Right. So they were doing that here, right? In, the, in San Jose. San Jose has some of the worst water now in the U.S. because this is contaminated with chromium-6. Because, and I know because in the 70s, the silicon companies were all pouring their waste down the drain. So they contaminated the groundwater. And once the Clean Water Act came into play and the EPA started measuring how much chromium you're using, and they wanted to account for every molecule of it, then they just moved all the operations to Malaysia and overseas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could, could you say something a little more, because I really don't know about this, I'm not thinking about it, about just the general sustainability of the internet, because you're putting a lot of hope in the internet and cell phones and so on, but yet these use you know, rare minerals and um, so on. I mean, so I, I really just don't know how mm -hmm. sustainable. And, you know, as a as a technical person, what can you say? Well, it, you know, the uh, the current model of the internet is that it is it's a bottomless pit. You keep throwing things into it, and it stores it over and I mean, it stores everything you've ever done. There are like computers sitting there waiting. Just in case you click on some photo you took 20 years ago. Because if you click on that photo and you don't get that photo right away, you get mad at the service. So they're sitting there waiting. <laughs> All those computers are doing nothing. Right? All this old data. We have to start giving up on that, some of those things. Huh? So we'll have to figure out how we uh, change the architecture of the internet as well over time. So, yeah, certain things we don't need anymore. Rebecca, I mean, I do want to ask about like these rare minerals. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, right. we still use have them. Will they all get used up? I mean, um, you, you know, doesn't the internet um, depend on them? 
Currently, yes. This is why I say this is the greatest research program that we have to do. Currently, we are using a lot of uh, rare minerals and toxic processes in everything we do. Not just the internet. For toilet paper, for heaven's sake. We, we have been taught that white is better than brown and black. Okay? So, toilet paper, we want it to be white. We, you know, is there any white tree out there? It comes from brown paper pulp, so we are bleaching it to make it white. And in the process, when you bleach brown paper pulp, you get dioxin. So they locate all the paper mills where this, this process is happening in poor neighborhoods, so that the rich people don't have to breathe all this dioxin. But that dioxin comes back in the food that the rich people eat, in much, much higher concentrations than the poor people are breathing. So, so anyway, all our processes have to change. Sure. The life is those, those of you who know me, a, a pretty, uh, what seems to be extreme, and I do without a lot of things like cars and planes and toilet paper and the rest of it. But I think it's uh, not helpful so much to think about, oh, this thing, computers, the internet, um, this thing and that thing, they all have some, because of the system they're part of, they all have some uh, polluting effect, they all have some harsh effect. To think then that oh, we can't use anything, and then the result then is that let's just give up. Right. Because, you know, you can use the internet and make a tenth of the waste that someone else is using it. If you use it a little differently, if you get your computer from FreeGeek, you know, if you get recycled paper, it, each decision makes a big difference. We're doing it so badly, so right. wastefully, that you don't have to give up everything mm -hmm. because you want absolute purity. That kind of mind makes people gives paralysis. Right. You know? So look at the things that you can do that make a huge difference. Right. And it won't be perfect or pure. It'll never be perfect or pure. But I think that's really important. Because otherwise, sometimes people look for an excuse to not do anything because, oh, well, it's never going to be pure. Right. But it can be a lot better. I mean, see, our intentions are good, right? If you're looking at it for how are we going to reduce our footprint, how are we going to bring back the animals, you know, use it for that. Use it for that. And then uh, eventually, it will sort itself out, right? Because everybody is going to be figuring out how to minimize our impact on, on the animals or on ourselves. Right? This is organically, this system has been created organically, right? It is created it's at its current state where we have said money is above everything else. And that's how we have come to where we are. We are polluting like crazy. We are killing lots of people. We are killing lots of animals with our pollution. But uh, once we change that and mindset and we say, no, that's very important that they also have good, clean water to drink, then we will change our processes over time. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you think if people were, I don't know, because I had this train of thought because my family, um, was they were all eating animals and they saw that I was depressed and they thought something that would be good for me to do was animal activism. And they're like, why don't you put energy into animal activism? You need to care about animals. And I said, hey, you all love me and believe in me and you're still eating animals. Well, how can I reach anybody else? And I wonder that about like with Gandhi going on foot places and talking to people that if Instead of like, I know like the internet can be a good way of teaching people, but if people were like more willing to open up to people that you make casual connections with, you know, right. say on the Mac, say at the grocery store, like, and instead of going into like maybe our personal stories, like saying stuff that's really inspired us or things that we've changed in our lives that could be helpful for other people to start thinking differently. Right. Thank you. I was wondering on um, the concept that the best thing we could do is close the gates and keep the people out. Mm -hmm. That uh, is that is is there? Do you think we need a new religion that puts nature first or that has a new respect for everything? We we need to reformulate our thinking. Do we, do you believe in working with in, or a, organizations of faith? And I wondered if they're really capable of transferring the message in the right way, you know, or uh, let, to be able to let go of, of nature and believe that it's really a wonderful force uh, that's 
with us, not against us. Right. Um, everything we we need to know is already there in the books. You know, in the sense that every religion is talking about the same thing. It's selflessness is the highest form of selfishness. You know, love, kindness, compassion. I mean, this is uh, like the 40 interfaith leaders who signed that declaration. They were from all different faiths. Every faith leader said, compassion for all creation is the foundation of our religion. It's acting out, you know, and, and making sure that your actions match your words. Uh, and when our leaders don't do that, the rest of us look up to the leaders and we say, if they cannot do it, we don't have to do it either. If they're not doing it, we don't have to do it, right? Like Pope Francis wrote something really beautiful in the Laudato Si. He said, it's contrary to human dignity to cause animals to suffer or die needlessly. That's a vegan message. Mm -hmm. He wrote that in 2015, March, or April, when it came out. And then in November, when he was visiting New York, he was reported to have eaten a veal and lobster dinner. Right? How does he justify that? Maybe he thinks it's, he needs it. I don't know. I don't know how he would justify that. But, but it's there in, his, in, the, in all the religions. So we really don't need a new one. It's about coming together as vegans and, you know, and saying that all faiths are talking about the same thing. And you, we all started with different stories, right? So Hinduism started with the stories from the forests. And Christianity started with stories from the desert. But we are now taking this, I mean, the good thing about veganism is that no religion had ever gone that far. Some religions stopped at not eating pork or not mixing milk and meat or, or don't eat any meat but drink milk, you know. So we had, we had different prescriptions in our religions. All of us, all of the religions. But no religion ever said, go vegan. So it's a step that all religions can take together and say, this is a common thing that we are all doing for the benefit of the planet. So this is why I'm hoping that religions can come together and do this, because the, their grassroots reach is huge. Right? So I'm... That will be my secondary appeal is to all the churches and mosques and temples. I'm going to go around and talk to them. By the way, <coughs> the Baha'i faith, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it was Baha'u'llah, the founder, or the, uh, his main uh, uh, disciple, mm -hmm. I remember his name, um, but he made a comment, one of them made a comment, that the food of <coughs> meat will not be the food of the future. And this was about 100, over 100 years ago. Right. So we're kind of entering, we're already in the future yeah, <laughs> from their perspective. Right, yeah. Um, but in India, it's the milk that's the big problem. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, India used to have 600 million lacto-vegetarians. I don't know what the, what the number is now because a lot of people are beginning to eat meat. But uh, 600 million lacto-vegetarians all demanding milk and cheese every day. They're proliferating the cows, okay, to produce all that milk. And if you don't kill the cows, which is what the original intent was, so until about 2008, I think India's slaughter rate was like six, uh, seven percent of the cow population annual slaughter rate. And then you can see the slaughter rate going up because you have, you know, there's too many of them being produced. So they are, uh, they are now, India has become the largest exporter of beef on the planet. Mm. Which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a disgrace for the land of Ahimsa. Mm -hmm. <coughs> wow. Not to mention all the, the male calves that are not in that process of dairy. So 
So yeah, previously they used to let the male cats also live. Uh, so they were they were walking around eating up things, eating mm -hmm. up the forest or eating up trash there in the cities. And, and now they're so all being killed. They're commodity. Yeah. And they're being commoditized and killed. Yes. Can you tell us about the Sacred Lifeline project? Right. The Sacred Lifeline project, uh, the concept is to create a community where students can come together with retired professors and professionals and people who are like elders. So half the community would be permanent residents and the other half would be temporary people who come uh, in and out, you know, students, uh, anthropology students, uh, tech engineering students, who are trying different things out to figure out what would be the minimum necessary for the new system. Uh, and how do we live in this, you know, when we reduce our footprint so that if everybody lived like us, you will only use up half the earth. So it has this half earth constraint and we have this Ahimsa coin technology to measure our footprint and uh, and then how do we do this how do we make decisions in this new environment where it is a scale free network right so it's an entirely new way of trying thinking right so you need a lot of research to be done so this is why we wanted to create this a project where we get people to come in and uh, try things out so i got like five different universities to say we'd be happy to participate in it they were going to send students, PhD students and master's students to work with us. Professors said they would take sabbaticals and come work with us. Um, the, f the first site was going to be in Colorado. And now we are talking to people to see how many people would support this. Because we need some resources to make this happen. Uh, but I was visiting uh, Costa Rica just last, just last week. And someone came and said, I'll offer you 150 acres of land to do this in the blue zone of Costa Rica. And they are ready to help us, you know, and the whole nation is behind it. Because Costa Rica is the only country that I think has no military yes. at all, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Since 1948. And they also have 54% of their land already forested. So the half-earth principle is already there in Costa Rica. So in the other half, if you can show how human beings can live without destroying the forest and without bringing things from the outside, because right now a lot of importing is happening for, for their consumption. But it's, right. it's far from being vegan. It's, it's far from being vegan. From people who are there. Right, but the, but the community is growing. So I was invited to speak at a vegan festival. It's called the Switch Festival, and the gentleman who made this offer, uh, he started a non-profit called Mundo Vegano, which means vegan world. And he wants to see a vegan world happen. Uh, and he was inspired by Cowspiracy to do this. By who? Cowspiracy. This oh, your group. Yeah, group. The documentary. Movie. I'm sorry. He said he watched it, he finished watching it at uh, 7 o'clock at night. And then he spent time till 3 o'clock in the morning researching all the facts. And then he said, I'm going to do this. I have to do this. So he quit everything he was doing and started Mundo Vigano. So you don't know, you know how things happen. Right? So anyway, he, uh, so we are looking at that. Because that, there is a lot of support from the government there. And there is a lot of support from, uh, from the planning commissions and things like that. So that we, we can do this there without, without a lot of roadblocks. Whereas Colorado, I was already seeing a lot of roadblocks. Mm. Okay. Well, every house, you know, you can't have, uh, you can't have a common kitchen and then mm. humble houses. So that architecture is not part of the current plan. So you have to go and get variants for that. So she's talking about constructing this ideal village. Right. I think Cresto it was going to be. Right, yeah. It's going to be. So there are a lot of variances we have to get in the planning commissions. Yeah. How was the attendance in Costa Rica at the conference? At the conference, the attendance was not as big as we expected. I mean, there were about 100 people in my audience when I was giving a talk. 
but uh, the, they were expecting more people to come. But they also said we probably didn't do a good job of marketing it. Um, so they were going to do. They're definitely going to do this festival again next year. <coughs> they said they were going to take care of the marketing next time. But a lot of people are coming and trying it out. It is all. It's a completely vegan festival, and there were about 40, about 40 stalls, and there was music on one side and lectures on the other side. So I think the evenings were the music, and the music was well attended. People were coming to listen to the music. Yes. Well, I like what you said early on about if somebody they get little coins for every 15 minutes that they're doing whatever is you know good or whatever. And what I do now is I just consider myself. I give and receive joy points. Mm -hmm. and I know when they happen, and there's no way to accumulate them, put them in the bank, and there's no need to. Right. And the way our system is designed is, it's by this money. Right. We need money for everything. Right. To live, and money is the religion right. of God. So it's an extrinsic motivator. Right. When what you're talking about is an intrinsic motivator. Exactly. Right. So that's where the shift. Right. Is happening with everyone here. But I just want love and compassion. Money, if I need it. For survival, right. but spiritual driving. So that was cool about that analogy. Yeah, the idea is to give everyone a sense of security that they belong in a community, and then everyone will contribute what they are good at, you know, to make the community work. So it's, uh, and we know how to do this, right? But the trouble that people had in the past, like Gandhi, what the trouble that he had in the past was that. People don't trust more than 150 people around them. And then they say, oh, that's a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why we needed to have hierarchies in the past. Nowadays, I mean, we are trusting people on Amazon, you know, <laughs> just by looking at their ratings, right? <laughs> so our trust networks are huge. Have you uh, ever I considered working with a group like SELC in California. The Sustainable Economies Law Center? Yeah. I, I was thinking about that because they, they focus on food uh, equity and, and, you know, small kitchens, you know, where there's all these, you know, large kitchen, commercial kitchen requirements for preparation of food nice. and, and seed libraries. They're, they're focusing on all these different aspects of the law that are interfering right. with right. where we're trying to go right. as far as you know right. moving society and moving the, mm -hmm. the, right. moving towards a more constructive right. use so I, I don't know if, if you consider um, uh, you know working with them but you, know, you might find some some useful uh, benefit there for like you're talking about uh, helping to deal with the zoning laws and yeah thank you I mean, can you send me that? Sure. Information? Yeah. Just email me and because uh, I would love to uh, look at what they're doing. Thank you. Now, I have to tell you that some of these organizations will kind of disappoint you. Um, I had this experience with a wonderful organization here in, in Portland when I came here um, that's designed to promote growing uh, fruits and they also distribute it to the poor. Speaking <laughs> of vegan food expensive or not. So they're promoting it as healthy food and I donated my photography to them. So I went and I heard this very seriously of obese people come on stage and say, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're helping the poor get uh, quality food, which, which I, was, I was for. But then I looked around and all those rich people that were donating money to that cause were eating, uh, you know, crappy food, there was not a piece of fruit in, on any plate, and even some of the cells were not vegan, if you can imagine that. Right. And I was like, what, what are you guys, what are you guys doing, you know? Right. So, a, a lot of those organizations, you know, they will say, oh, but we distribute meat to the poor, and we don't, we don't want to lose that. I think this is 
is really common among people getting together to try to uh, cause change. Um, I didn't bring any food today. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the things that is wrong with our culture is we're not programmed to bring food to share with each other. Um, but I think that's one of the most powerful ways that we can cause change. Um, Potlucks are, you know, a great way to... And actually we have food for people who want to eat that. <laughs> Thank you. The permaculture people always need more bodies. And some of those are really fun gatherings where people are escaping the sinister numbers of uh, our impact on the earth for a while to play in the dirt. So that can be a really good therapy. Right. Even if you don't get to pick the fruit of your labor, it can still be a feeling that uh, something to do that helps escape the, you know, the kind of the anxiety of uh, just cutting things out of your lifestyle. You can do add, add certain thing, activities to your lifestyle that are that are fulfilling. Right. But I'm convinced that the transformation is going to happen. The great transition is going to happen by 2026. Okay, because I, uh, when when I did my first calculation, I was there with the, uh, I was uh, introducing my advisor for an award in San Francisco. My PhD advisor was getting an award, and he asked me to introduce him. And I blurted out to the audience, I did this calculation that when my granddaughter is 16 years old. All wild animals will die. Will be dead. And I want to make a pledge to her today that there'll be more wild animals when she's 16 than when she was born in 2010. And everybody stood up and clapped. <laughs> everybody wants this to happen, right? So I'm convinced that we are going to make this happen. And so I just tell people, you're, we are all going to be vegan. Okay? Everybody is going to be vegan. It's just a matter of whether you're vegan year one, year two, year three, or year nine, you know, pick and choose. You have only nine years left. So you talk about making a new system, but right. how do you do that when the systems that create all the problems, such as, you know, this <clears throat> subsidies of, you know, right, these right. industries, right. how, how, you know, without changing that? It, I mean, it doesn't... Food deserts, places where people don't have... Right. Access to food. Right. So the, uh, do you know how a caterpillar turns to a butterfly? So basically what happens is that the caterpillar gets too big for his skin. And then he stops. And he builds a cocoon around himself. Hangs under a twig. And inside the caterpillar, new cells are born. These new cells are called imaginal cells. They don't look like the caterpillar cells. So the caterpillar's immune system fights them tries to kill all the imaginal cells as they are born. But over time, more and more imaginal cells are born. And the immune system is powerless to kill them. It stops. Then the imaginal cells start clumping together. They form different organs of the butterfly. Over time. Okay? And then the butterfly comes out. And that's the transformation that's happening now among us. They know that veganism is... This is why they don't want to talk about it. This is why Al Gore doesn't want to talk about it. Climate scientists don't want to talk about it. I mean, can you imagine this? I went to the AGU, the largest gathering of climate scientists in the world, AGU fall meeting, in December of 2015. <coughs> and I made the present of the paper about the how much carbon can be sequestered in forests if the grasslands are returned to forests. And everybody told me, you're right, but it'll never happen. Okay? That's basically what family members of mine have said. Right. It'll never happen. Mm -hmm. I said, that's exactly what I heard about the internet in 1995. Yeah? They told me that. You know, I said, they were, they were having trouble getting a 100 megabit ethernet to work. Okay? And I did the analysis on that cable and I said, I, I can do a gigabit on this. I can do 10 times faster. 
and make it so robust that when it falls back to 100, it will never fail. They said, you're out of your mind, man. I mean, we're having trouble getting 100 to work. You're talking about doing 1,000. So they said, but we let you play. So they let me play. And within nine months, they knew that I was serious because there were tons of people coming to my meetings. And they all had different ways of doing this. So they knew it was serious. Then by 1999, it became a standard, gigabit Ethernet. And the Internet took off. By 2003, we were selling 150 million units a year. Okay? This is the same Internet that they said was going to die in 1995. So it just took off. So when people tell me that things cannot be done, I know it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and when the climate scientist told me that, you know, you're right, it, but it's never happened. I went for the banquet, and the, the main course in the banquet was steak. <laughs> That's why it doesn't happen in their mind, because they're still eating steak. Right? So they haven't switched their model. our children in public school in particular and and have the kind of food that we feed them in public school. Right. Subsidized milk and lots of cheese and right. terrible food in the US in particular. And also wondering like how parents will let their kids eat school right. lunch sometimes rather than take all the time to go shopping and make a, a nutritious meal for them, put it together right. every day. I mean, I'm a chef and I had did that with, for both my boys their whole lives, but it was a lot of work. Right. And even now I live in a house with a community and um, they they won't eat vegan unless I make it. Right. And like, how many people in here know how to cook? Like a three course meal. Okay, so that's just many people. How many people in here like to really like to go out to a restaurant and eat? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right, so I'm just saying that like, it's the idea of having like community potlucks. Right. I love that idea, and we've done several different forms of that in Portland, from food not bombs to like right. a thing we had in my house called Ninja Cafe, where we dumpstered food and served it on weekends for people, to all kinds of gatherings. Um, and it seems to be like if you have a community that supports each other and you have someone who can cook um, or, or grow food and know what to do with it after they grow it, um, that people will join the choir, so to speak, right. and do right. that. But if you don't have that and they don't know how to cook, they don't know how to grow food, and they don't um, do it in community and we're not teaching it in school, but that's an enormous battle. Right. You know, it's, it's huge. It's so much easier to just go to a food cart and get a $5 whatever. Meat is cheap, you know, or right. any of the animal products. Right. So I don't know if you have any suggestions around, like, how you guys started your community pot, like how many people right. come to it, suggestions of, of, of how to get people interested. Like, we could start a list today and say everyone in here is invited to a potluck dinner, everybody brings some vegan Right. food and I think it would you know maybe half the group would come and it'll fizzle out because it seems like it's just too much work for people. What is happening in uh, Phoenix is that uh, a couple who love to cook started a business. Okay. They started a business of uh, food service. So they cook um, so they so they put out the menu on Wednesday and people order. So they get like, you know, oh, thousands of servings that they, that they cook every week. People are ordering for the whole week and they come and, buy, they come and pick it up on Monday and Tuesday. So then they cook on uh, Saturday and Sunday in the community kitchen. And then on Monday they have a community dinner with all the leftover food. Okay? And the leftover food, it's a pay-as-you-can dinner. People are coming, they don't have to cook. They come to, to sample everything that Ingrid had cooked for the whole week. You know, so there are like 15 different dishes. They're all sampling little bits of it and they enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. 
and, and then they choose to become customers or not. It doesn't matter for her. So it's pay as you can, and people who don't pay, they want to contribute. Nobody wants to just eat and leave, no? People are, they, they come and clean the floor. So Ingrid, she cooks, and then she serves, she puts the dinner out, and people come and take all the food, and then her kitchen gets completely clean by the time Monday ends, mm -hmm. by the community. Mm -hmm. So she loves it, the community loves it, you know, and she's growing her business that way, mm -hmm. okay? So it's a positive feedback loop. Everything is positive in that. Of course, now she says, I have too much work. Yeah. <laughs> so she's trying to hire more cooks, and, you know, and she, wants to, she wants to franchise this idea out to lots of other places. I'd like to see more planning done with children in schools and because, you know, that's what we're going to teach them while they're right, young. Yeah. And both of my kids read books about slaughterhouses when they were younger and they decided they didn't want to eat right. animals after reading that. Um, they both do still now. After They went through a phase. It was like a phase for them. but um, And they're influenced by their friends and the Right, right. community and so yeah. on and, and also they're Native American and they have hunting and fishing rights year round and they love salmon so it's really hard to, to um, get people to shift and unless I, unless I make every meal for them and I just happen to make it vegan <laughs> it's, it's probably it's really hard it's not going to happen so what has happened in my granddaughter's school she's now in uh, kindergarten mm -hmm. um, so she goes to a school called Awakening Sea, and uh, she's a you know she's a six year old right. So she just tells other kids, "What are you eating? Why are you eating that? <laughs> That's an animal, right?" So uh, she asked me to come and talk to her friends, and I did. So it was she. They all have sharing day. So she was. She said she wanted to share about her necklace that you had given her, <laughs> the vegan necklace. She said, Grandpa, can you come and talk to my friends about the vegan necklace? And I did. And a week later, I got a call from the principal saying, don't ever talk about that anymore because the parents are all upset. <laughs> right? Then we invited the principal and her husband and all the staff to what the hell screening. And they all came. And they all turned vegan. <laughs> so the principal is now vegan, right? Her husband is vegan, and the director is vegan. And so they're all now saying, hey, the kids are eating toxins. Concentrated doses of toxins. So they're trying to tell their parents, you know, watch out what, they, what you're feeding your kids. So this is how the awareness spreads, you know. But you're right, public schools are Obviously, um, the government is, has a stranglehold on what the kids are eating. I've seen it in Ghana. In Ghana, it is so awful to watch the kids eating junk like that in school because they're all forced to go to, um, to boarding school for high school. Right? Every child goes to a boarding school far away. It's a good thing because it mixes the tribes in Ghana, but then they're fed meat, yeah, horrible food. And everywhere in Ghana you see mango trees, papaya trees, I mean fruit trees everywhere. This is a very fertile country, okay? But they're all hanging there. Nobody's eating them. It's sad. Because they, the kids have been taught to eat that junk. Well, you have this in Portland. You don't have to go to Ghana. Um, a lot of restaurants here offer um, free burgers to kids on Sunday. Good so time. you go, you pay two dollars for a burger, and the kids get it for free. Yeah. Yeah. No veggie burgers. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. There's there's even something called Meat Church, which I've been quite upset about. It's to help the people who are houseless, um, close further east, and they can all go to this church, and they have to attend the religious service. Mm. So it's not Chinese religion, Western religion, and then at the end of the service, they can get. A meal with meat in it, mm. and the, a lot of the houses people are very excited to be able to go to that. Yeah, I mean the industry is fighting back, you know. 
I mean, they, they don't want to, no industry wants to shrink, mm -hmm. right? So they are, they, are, they are now all over India and China getting people to eat more and more, right? But, but I think they see the writing on the wall too. Because it's getting harder and harder for them. You know, dairy, dairy farms are closing here uh, because dairy is one of those things which is very hard for you to export. Meat is being exported because the demand here is dropping. Yes, do you, um, uh, I'm curious about what you see as weak points within the animal agriculture industry itself, ways that it's, um, you know, potentially liable to collapse in on itself just because it's, not, not stable in those ways, either either in terms of the, the product and the relation to the consumer base, or the economics of it, or, um, uh, you know, like coal has been dying, not because of, not so much because of environmental activism as I understand it, but because um, <laughs> it's getting outpaced by all these other energy technologies, and it's a just... Hmm? A new model. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that people are fighting and winning, it's just it's no longer financially feasible right, right. relative to these other ways. So I'm, I'm curious, financially, politically, organizationally, health-wise, you see weak points within the animal industry. I mean, clearly the animal agriculture industry has a lot of weak points, right? This is why it has to be a secret industry. They're trying to prevent people from taking pictures, and but it's impossible to stop it. It's, it's just out there now. You know, the documentaries are all coming out, and YouTube is full of videos. So they are fighting a losing battle, if you ask me. So they are going to collapse. But uh, they can bring down the whole economy with it. This is why they're propped up by the governments. Governments are coming up with ways to support them promote their products. It's not just the U.S. government. Governments everywhere mm -hmm. are doing this. You know, uh, because in the current model, if you keep it stable and you keep going, you're going to reach that techno split, the extreme inequality between a few people who have everything and the rest who have nothing. That's where this current model is headed. Okay? So, uh, so they see that the option is Techno split versus complete collapse. So someone was giving me this analogy of if you are in a canoe and it's leaky, uh, you're better off, you know, keep rowing. <laughs> right? Keep trying to bail the water out, keep rowing. You know you're going to sink, but better that than topple the canoe right now. So that's the kind of state that they're in. Okay? So this is why we have to build a new canoe for them and say, here, this is a way to live that's better and that's uh, sustainable for the planet. Mm -hmm. And then I think they will all jump. I really think it will happen really fast once we show this and um, make it fun, make it enjoyable. Because I think building something new has to be fun. Is there a map of that original forest somewhere? Of oh, what forest. land used to be? Forest? forest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is, there are, I mean, based on fossil estimates, you know, yeah. Um, so they have, there are places where they've gone um, hundreds of years, thousands of years back. They know exactly where the forests were. The entire Sahara used to be forest. Entire desert, right? The desert that extends from the west uh, end of Africa all the way into Ch India and all the way into China, that entire area used to be forest. At first they thought that the forests died because the monsoons disappeared. There used to be North African monsoons. Uh, but now they know, now we know that if you deforest, the rains stop. Right? 
So it wasn't that the monsoons disappeared, we deforested and then the rain stopped coming. Then it became a forest. I mean, then it became a desert. Yeah, we had a problem in Israel with the swamp. The swamp was a major problem for settlers. So they drained the swamp. What a great thing. And now they're like, oh, we're, so we, we're just so sorry that we drained the swamp because it was actually a great ecosystem. Right. And soon Israel is just going to be a barren land again. We killed this wonderful little thing. It wasn't more, it was a swamp. But a swamp houses a lot of different forms of life. But you know, it's easier for us to bring it back in Israel than it is to, to create something new on Mars, right? Yes, <laughs> sure, that's true. <laughs> yeah, someone said that, um, sure, we, we could probably do something on Mars eventually with technology, but this, that same technology would be much easier to implement here. Right. Mars, <laughs> that's terraform. That's energy. Terraform. <laughs> yeah. Send enough people to Mars, it solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Send the right people to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you know they all. I mean, we we all are going to solve it right here. Do you have any advice for how to talk to people? Like, I don't think I'm very skilled at talking to my family and friends about my own lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still kind of have to talk about it sometimes, especially when I'm with them and not right. participating in things. Right. And, yeah, I don't really know. I would like advice or tips or whatever. See, what I find is that uh, I'm true to myself, right? So, meaning, I'm, I'm not going to eat that, and I'm not going to do this, you know, so, and people get curious because I'm out of the ordinary. And they ask me, why are you doing that? And that gives me an opportunity to talk to them about it, right? So I don't compromise on my values. So I don't go and say, well, you know, here it's like this, so I, I should go along with them. I say, can you give me something that's not this, but that? You know, and then they ask you, why? And it gives you an opportunity to talk about it. So that's where the activism happens, actually, in all our, our circles, our immediate circles. Um, because people do want to, you know, and then they, they are also thinking. They're all good people too. So they're all thinking, they're saying, oh, maybe he's right. Maybe I should think about it. So that's how a lot of my people, a lot of my uh, friends and family got converted. I, I never said, you have to do this. It's just, they just asked me questions and then before I knew it, they were vegan too. <laughs> I want to add to that that a common theme, I mean, throughout everything I hear you talking about is compassion mm -hmm. um, and, and community. And, and like all these things you're talking about is they come together not because of the structure or someone plans this or that, it's because the people have these mutually caring, respectful, appreciative, celebratory relationships with each other. Right. The relationship is already there. Right. And so when then that's there, then it's, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, come over to my house and we'll do this thing, or, right. or let me tell you about this. Right. You know, so, so, and I think some, like in this culture, for, for most of us, like we're pretty individualized and separated, and there's a lot of tension and conflict, and some of us feel alienated from families, and, you know, and it's, there's not that loving compassion there. Or, or maybe there is, but there's a lot of pain and resentment, you know, that's, that's gotten in the way, and mistrust. Mm -hmm. And people get tired of, you know, being nagged and sort of being beaten over the head. Well, you should go vegan because blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So what I found just in my own life is that anytime I'm coming from this place of total compassion and not the, well, I care about you and I want you to be healthy and I think, you know, not this kind of, good, but like actually feeling good about my connection with this person. Okay. Actually feeling positive and trusting and, and inspired and wow, I enjoy the conversations that I have with these people. When I'm coming from that place mm -hmm. and I continue to come from that place as I bring up the topic about what matters to me and I just let myself be open and vulnerable. 
I say, oh, this is really, this is a challenge for me. And I look at this, you know, and I'm not trying to preach to them. I'm not trying to change them. I'm not, I'm just, my focus is on the connection with them. <coughs> That's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. That's where people, I find, are most receptive to hearing about stuff. You know, you can study all these tools and techniques, like, John Gottman's relationship research, and Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, and Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication, and, and all of these things. And those are all great tools and skills to have. But if underneath those tools, in the moment, and I've learned some of them, and I, I forget my compassion, I forget my trust, but, I, but I, I use that tool or whatever anyway, the other person sees through it and they, they say, or they, you know, they say, aha! You're trying to control me. You don't actually, you're not enjoying this connection with me. You're trying to tell me what to do. Right. I don't want to be part of that. Right. And then they resist and they get right. defensive and it breeds animosity. Right. So it's about training yourself to be with your watching child. The yes. watching child is compassionate and detached. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I meditate every day for one hour. You know, but that helps a lot. Do you have any of your CDs there available to purchase? Uh, you know, I didn't bring too many copies, but I'm just going to leave one copy here. Uh, but this you can get online. And uh, uh, even uh, What the Hell. Just Netflix or YouTube? Netflix has, Netflix has that. Netflix has all three of them. Human Experiment, Conspiracy, and What the Hell. And uh, these can be bought on Amazon. Russell will have a lot more copies. I'll go have 12. Uh, 20 copies. 200 dollars worth of conspiracy. They're all gone. <laughs> well, we're going to order some more. Eight in the way. Eight in the way. Where was that? Are you buying stock? Where was it? Okay, real quick. Where I practice on nature path. So, I'm a devotee of Dr. Rouse. <laughs> I read his books actually six times. I'm a slow, I'm kind of like Colombo. I take the slow to read over and over and over again. And then memorize all of the general facts. It's good. It's like amazing stuff. It's like, wow, it's all in one little book. It's all summed up very easily. So if any of the people want to hear one of our books, do you fill out any of your books? Uh, I think I, I just ordered another batch, so they, they should be in in a few days. All right, July 3rd. Yeah, you will come by and we'll sell them to you for $5. If you don't have $5, I'll give them to you. <laughs> Silish is doing two longer presentations. Oh, yeah. uh, one on Thursday at the Heart of, Heart of Wisdom Zen Temple, and one on Friday at the Downtown Unitarian Church. Okay. And uh, I've got flies here. Anyone wants to look at the details, or if they want to take one and put it up somewhere, it's free. <laughs> so, like, like Sida said, he's going to try to his next tour. He's going to try to go to, to churches and places of faith and convince people. So he's already actually doing that on Thursday. I right. helped to arrange a meeting at the Den Temple. Unbelievably enough, many Buddhists are still not vegan. So uh, that should be interesting. And, and I've seen Sida's one of his longer presentations, and it's really wonderful. So you can come back again and still get some new information and wonderful slideshows and stuff like that. So consider those two later things and invite people to come to them, especially if they're not vegan already. Thank you.